This is the 13th annual National Book Festival. The first was held in 2001 on the grounds of the Capitol. We're here on the Mall between the Capitol and the Washington Monument. This is Book TV's 15th year on the air as well. We're going to begin taking your calls, and when Mr. Berg gets here, we will ask him those questions. We want to start with Ron in Everett, Washington. Hi, Ron. Yes, uh, good day. Thank you for taking my call. I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Berg, uh, in his biography, he cites as an important book and an influence on him, Eugene Smith's book entitled, When the Cheering Stops. But I'm wondering, however, if he's aware that professional historians almost universally have criticized that book as being riddled with inaccuracies. And my second question is, in light of John Milton Coover's recent biography, why would a reader want to choose your biography since he's a professional historian, he spent his whole career studying Wilson? And, and Thank uh, you. Ron, the, the author of the, the second person you were talking about, what was the name again? John Milton Coover. He's a professional historian. He's the country's leading expert on Wilson. Could you spell that last name? I'm sorry, it's just a little distorted here. Yeah, Coover, C-O-O-P-E-R. Thank you, Ron. We will ask Mr. Berg that when he gets settled. And we're going to take another call from Stephen in Princeton, New Jersey, former home of Woodrow Wilson. Hi, Stephen. Hello, Peter. How are you? Good. Good. Um, I'm curious. Um, I'd like to ask Mr. Berg if Mrs. Wilson spoke about her husband's illness and all the activities during in her later years, because I know she lived for many years after President Wilson's death. My second question is, it's roughly the same as my first, which is, did Vice President Marshall, um, what did he think of what um, happened with President Wilson and his illness and the cover-up in his later years, too? Thank you very much, Peter. Great, Stephen. Thanks so much for that call. Joining us now here on our set is the author of Wilson, A. Scott Berg. Mr. Berg, thanks for being with us. Thanks. While we were waiting for you to get ready, we took a couple calls. Okay. And the second was from Stephen in Princeton, New Jersey. Good. And Stephen wanted to know a little bit more about Edith and whether Edith, in her later years, talked about Woodrow Wilson's <laughs> illness and that time when she, as you say, essentially was running the country. Uh, basically, she talked about her illness privately. And she, she maintained a fairly private life. She became a society woman here in town. The Democrats were always happy to trot her out for the odd event. Uh, and I would just add, it's just sort of a great little moment in history that in 1961, when JFK was inaugurated president, there on the reviewing stand, sitting in the third row, was this little old lady that nobody knew who she was, and it was Mrs. Woodrow Wilson. So among her friends, yes, she talked about it, but generally she talked not about her role, she talked about how horrible it was for Woodrow Wilson having to go around the country and sell the, the league when he physically really wasn't able to do that. And really she was most angry at Henry Cabot Lodge, the leader of the Republican opposition, and she forever blamed him. Uh, for his having to wage that fight as he did. Stephen's other question was about Vice President Marshall and what he thought about that and if he ever talked about the stroke. Uh, Marshall basically remained pretty silent on the subject, uh, not only of the stroke, but of Woodrow Wilson. Um, as, as I just mentioned in my talk, Will, uh, Marshall wrote this uh, memoir that is hundreds of pages of long and Woodrow Wilson is is barely a character and I mean you really have to go looking for Woodrow Wilson the president of the United States the other call we took while we were waiting for you was from Ron in Everett Washington and he said that uh, you reference Eugene Smith's book in your book Wilson <laughs> and he says do you know that that was riddled with inaccuracies well yes it's riddled with inaccuracies but it also really captures the spirit of what was going on. And at 15, I certainly didn't know it was riddled with accuracies. And truth be told, when I write my books, I basically don't rely on anything but primary sources. So Gene Smith's book was not there as a reference book for me, but it was there as something that I felt then and still feel really captured the spirit of this man, enough at least to make a 15-year-old feel, gee, that's a life worth reading more about. And uh, Ron's other question was about John Wilton Cooper. John Milton Cooper? Milton Cooper. Yes. What, what, what are your thoughts about him? Well, um, John Milton Cooper is a great Wilson scholar. Uh, he has written many books on Wilson. 
He wrote a biography a few years ago, which I must confess I did not read, because I was deep in the middle of writing my own book. And again, I only use primary sources. And above all, I didn't want to be influenced in any way by his book. And so I, I will confess I did pick up his book when it came out, because I already had in my mind the opening and the closing of my book. And I wanted to make sure he didn't have the same opening and closing. And I was relieved to find he had nothing even close to it. And so I stuck with what I think is a really dramatic opening. Here is the cover of Wilson by A. Scott Berg. And the next call we're going to take is from Michael right here in D.C. Michael, you're on Book TV. Yes, uh, pleasure to speak with you. Um, Thank you. I am, I am um, interested in two <laughs> interceptions. I'm going to answer my question. I'll take it off the air. Um, as uh, a black American Muslim, I'm at the interest of the two intersections here. <laughs> One is dealing with the area of the segregation and the rise and fall at that particular time of the Ottoman Empire and the influences at that time in the Islamic world and how that has also affected the world politic backdrop at the time during the Woodrow Wilson. Thank you, and I take my uh, answer out there. Mr. Burke. Well, I, I don't know, know where to begin and what exactly to say. Um, I would start by saying that Woodrow Wilson was a most devout Christian. Um, he was not a big crusader against Muslims, but that being said, this is a man who read his Bible every night, who got on his knees to pray twice a day, uh, who said grace before every meal. So Christianity, also he being the son and grandson of Presbyterian ministers, Christianity was a huge part of his life. Um, now, the African-American situation is, is better defined. I never came across anything, just, just to tell you, in which I read any anti-Muslim sentiment on Woodrow Wilson's part. That being said, I really seldom read any anti-Negro, as it was called then, or anti-black, anti-African-American sentiment on Woodrow Wilson's part either. Um, if you look at Woodrow Wilson 100 years later, there's no question this was a racist in the White House. Back in 1913, he was something of a centrist. Uh, this was a period in which Klansmen proudly sat on the Supreme Court, sat in the United States Congress, uh, and Woodrow Wilson was basically attacked on both sides. He was attacked by the Southerners saying, don't do too much for the black man here. Why are you even appointing him to positions of some authority? And he was being attacked largely by Northern liberals uh, saying, why aren't you doing enough for these human beings who are citizens of yours? Uh, I think the greatest betrayal of African Americans by Woodrow Wilson came after World War I, actually. And it's interesting, I was reading a Time magazine a few weeks ago in honor of Martin Luther King, uh, and I remember there was something about Harry Belafonte talking about the black soldiers coming back from World War II and how they thought this was going to be a real moment for them to change their status, having given their lives, shed their blood, this would be a moment for them to be recognized as full-blooded Americans. Well, that same sentiment was expressed after World War I, where a lot of American soldiers, uh, black American soldiers, went off to war. Some died, some fought hard, some, you know, basically they did the scut work over there. And they returned thinking this would be the great moment of integration in America, and it was not. And this coupled with the other repressions going on in the country with the Alien and Sedition Acts being reenacted, uh, all that going on, uh, it was perhaps the worst single year uh, for race relations in the United States. Uh, the Red Summer, there was so much blood shed, in fact, in those, uh, that summer of riots. Next call for Scott Bird comes from Pete in Fort Benton, Montana. Good after, good morning, Pete. Hi, good morning. I'm uh, calling from Fort Benton, Montana, and I got a real simple question. When he went on his uh, tour around the country to sell the uh, uh, League of Nations, did he come to Montana and whereabouts? Uh, I'm sorry, I missed it. Did, did he come to Montana? Did yeah. he come to Montana? Yes, he did indeed. 
Uh, he, yes, he, he went to Helena. Uh, you know, when they put the tour together, uh, they very deliberately selected 